So in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7, he said, Desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. And notice this, but we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law was not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men-stealers, for liars, for perjured persons. And if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. The law is not made for a righteous man. And then we go to the book of Romans in chapter 2. Romans chapter 2, just read a couple of verses here. In Romans 2, we'll look at verse 21 to begin. There therefore which teachest another, teachest not thou, thy, thou not thyself. Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles, through you as it is written. For circumcision verily profiteth, if thou keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, Judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision, and notice this, dost transgress the law. For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. Neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but God. Now, Brother Sheila is going to explain all that on Sunday. We thank the Lord for him being willing to do that. The sum is this. It's not the circumcision that saves unless you keep the law. It's not the uncircumcision that damns. It's the transgression of the law. And if you're not going to live the law, don't preach the law. The law is that schoolmaster. I had not known lust except that the law said thou shalt not covet. And so when we look at law, it's not to put you in bondage. It's to free you from bondage. It's not to put you under the authority of letter. It's to free you and give you liberty in Christ. That's the purpose of the law. It's for the transgressor that he might see the error of his ways. We are going to look at a few scriptures tonight. If you would, let's start turn to Exodus 10. And in this, we're going to see a variety of laws, ordinances that God has given. There is a difference between law and ordinance. I dealt with some of this a couple of months ago, and a man who should have known better publicly asked me in front of a group of a mix of lost people and new converts, and he said, well, what do you do with the passage that tells you you don't mix wool and cotton? And I looked at him sternly and said, well, if it bothers you, don't wear wool with cotton. He didn't get it. 
So somebody else then asked the question, what about plowing with an ox and an ass together? And I said, talk to your pastor. He's the one that invited me here to preach. You see, people are choking on the law because they transgress the law. We'll talk about the Sabbath here, but can I say the New Testament explicitly gives us instruction concerning the assembly, and it is simply this, to forsake not the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. That's the instruction for the church concerning our time of assembly. We'll read law that speaks of the Sabbath, but yet the church met on the first day of the week. They assembled themselves. I know people that are Sabbath keepers. Is it a front? Is it an offense? Well, only if they don't keep it lawfully. And most of them go more than a mile from their home to go to church. So they're not lawful. It's a show of the flesh. It's a show for man. Dietary laws. Peter said he wouldn't eat those things common or unclean. He's never done it. And the Lord has sanctified them and rebuked Peter. and said, rise and eat, Peter. Therefore, I was in Cambodia quite a few years ago, and I went to the famous market of Phnom Penh. I don't know if they actually eat bugs or if they just fry them up for the tourists to eat. I really don't know. But the Filipinos with me devoured them. I ordered a tarantula just to say I tried tarantula and didn't get a chance to eat it. Because the Filipinos ripped it to pieces and woofed it down in violation of the law. But God cleansed it. And he said it's cleansed. It's why I can go eat a bacon cheeseburger and not be guilty of the law. Because it has been, God said explicitly it's been cleansed. Ordinances were specific to Israel for Israel, and the Lord has taken those things, and we are not bound to those because they were explicitly for Israel. But I'm going to show you ordinances tonight that are the law of God, and this is the same God that I am the Lord, I change not. And it's the I am of the law of God. Exodus chapter 10 and verse 2. That thou mayest tell in the ears of thy son, thy son's son, what things I have wrought in Egypt, and my signs which I have done among them, notice this, that ye may know how that I am the Lord. When the Lord appeared to Moses in that burning bush and said, I am that I am, he told them he was going to deliver them from Egypt land. Then he reminds them again and again, because you are called my people, because you are my chosen people, I am is going to lead you. I am is going to guide you. You'll tell your son's sons that I am brought you out. Verse 14, or chapter 14, rather, of Exodus, and verse 4. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart that he shall follow after them. And I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his hosts that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. So not only is Israel going to know that I am, Egypt is going to know I am. Pharaoh is going to know I am. It goes on again in verse 18. And the Egyptians shall know isn't it amazing? He said they shall know. Yet we have the word of God and there's people that still don't know. That's why John said that ye may know that ye have eternal life. The Egyptians knew, but they knew in judgment. And sadly, many people today won't know until judgment. They shall know that I am the Lord. Exodus 15 and verse 26. And said, if thou wilt diligently, and there's a, it is a caveat, it's that word if. If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and wilt do that which is right in his sight, and wilt give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. 
Chapter 16 and verse 12, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel speak unto them, saying, And even ye shall eat flesh, and in the morning ye shall be filled with bread, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 2. He begins commands with two words. I am. He begins his instruction with two little words. I am. And he says, I am the Lord thy God, which hath brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them for the Lord thy God is a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children of the third and fourth generations of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, thy maidservant, thy cattle, nor thy strangers within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Let me pause there. Communist China, home churches, the authorities watch them. They can't meet on a particular day of the week. Are they bound by this law? No. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. The church calls that assembly. Missionary Paul Scott made a great uh, statement when he said an assembly is simply, as on Christmas morning, parents and grandparents find out some assembly required is alive. Assembly is when you have all the right components, the right pieces, you have the orders, the instructions, and they all just perfectly come together, you have an assembly. It doesn't mean you bring a bell and have 10.30 on the sign, everybody comes and sits in their pew. No, it's when the assembly is called. Communist China, they meet whenever they can. A dear friend of ours was a missionary there for 25 years. He said that he would tell them, you've got to be silent. They're going to report you. 2.30 in the morning, that assemble on a Tuesday night. He'd walk up the stairs, and about the 10th flight up the stairs in the building, the apartment building, they'd hear the singing coming down the stairs. He said they had six-inch foam on the walls. They put mattresses over the doors. He said, but you couldn't stop the Chinese church from singing and singing for the glory of God. He said, by the time you got to the 14th or 15th floor, he said it sounded like a choir. And he said, hey, go and tell them, you all got to be quiet. They say, but preacher, this is what the Lord has done for us. Are they violated the Sabbath? No, they are not. Why? Because this is the church. God has called the church to assemble themselves together. That's why we're here on a Wednesday night. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Verse 24. An altar of earth thou shalt make unto me, and shalt sacrifice thereon thy burnt offerings and thy peace offerings, thy sheep and thine oxen. In all places where I record my name, I will come unto thee. I will bless thee. And if thou wilt make me an altar of stone, Thou shalt not build it of hewn stone, for thou lift up thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. Neither shalt thou go up by steps unto mine altar, that thy nakedness be not discovered thereon. Listen, church, we're in Christ. He is the Lamb of God. We come bold to the throne of grace by Christ. So you look at these, that's a very simple, obvious passage. We no longer build an altar of earth. 
We no longer bring lambs to the house of God to sacrifice. Why? Because the sacrifice has been complete in Christ. That's surety of a better testament in Jesus Christ. You and I have access to the throne of God through Jesus Christ. So there are things that the Lord explains to us. He helps us understand in this present day, you're not going to go to hell for eating snow crab legs. You're not going to damn your family and oysters on the half shell. You might get sick, but... So I'll give you a little evangelist hint. Get them to steam them lightly. Amen. But yet that's all the law some people have. Thou shalt not eat meat. The New Testament strictly forbade us from telling others they can't eat meat. It strictly forbade us from that. Why? Because the Lord knew there would be people that would damn meats. We don't eat things strangled and offered to idols, but if we do it ignorantly and ask not for our conscience sake, we're not bound by the law. So the Lord gives us this instruction. The Lord makes this very clear to us. What I want to look at today with the Lord's help, I want to look at the I am of the law of God. Leviticus chapter 11 I'll start in verse 44. For I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and this is why he's called us. And ye shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall you defile yourselves with any manner of creeping things that creepeth upon the earth. For I am the Lord that bringeth you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God, ye shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. So how's that law of the schoolmaster? It's for the unholy. He told us that. The law is for the unholy. It's for the sinner. It's for the transgressor of the law of God. The law is for that unrighteous man that does not see Jesus Christ, will not believe Jesus Christ. That's who the law is for. You know the amazing thing? So many times Jesus Christ would give illustrations. I'll use a really shallow little thing. A pastor asked me one time, he said, Brother McVeigh, said, we'd like to have you for a meal after the service. He said, are you offended you know, going to a restaurant on the Lord's Day? And I got spiritual on him. I said, well, brother, to be honest with you, I said, I'd prefer the ox on the table, but if it's in the ditch today, we can go down to the restaurant and eat it. And he got it immediately. He said, okay. What are you saying? If the ox is in the ditch, what man's not going to go get that, his ox out of a ditch on the Sabbath day? Why did David go eat the showbread off the table? Oh, he's a violator of the law. No, he was hungry. But he was a holy man. It was God's man. He didn't do it to be licentious. Oh, that, that hurts a little bit. He didn't do it as a rebel. He didn't do it as a covenant breaker. He didn't do it as an unrighteous man. He didn't do it as a truce breaker. He didn't do it as a defiler of man with mankind. He didn't do it as an adulterer. He did it out of necessity. That's why Jesus Christ uses that as an illustration to show us that the law was for the unrighteous. Book of Leviticus, let's go to chapter 18. And I'll be honest with you, church, I'm not nervous about what I'm going to preach. You know what makes me nervous? That people reject the word of God. This is what God says. Now listen, I'm going to say some things in here that are pretty stout. And I'm going to say some things that might hurt your feelings. But I want you to listen to the preacher. I'm going to do it by reading... The Bible. If you'd read it, you'd get your feelings hurt time to time. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, I am the Lord your God. I'm Listen, I'm not mocking. I'm not trying to be sarcastic. There's some people going to get their feelings hurt tonight. 
But you better rest assured it's God doing it. There's people going to get offended tonight. It's God doing it. And if you are offended, just hide it. Just go home and yell at God. And take it up with him. I am the Lord your God after the doings of the land of Egypt. Now notice this. After the doings of the land of Egypt, wherein you dwell, shall you not do. And after the doings of the land of Canaan, whither I bring you, shall you not do. Neither shall you walk in their ordinances. Why? The Lord said they're going to be a holy people. God is going to separate them unto himself. They're not going to live like they used to live, and they're not going to live like the people around them now. And just, Let's just go ahead and say amen and get a hold of that church. We're not going to live the way we used to live, and we're not going to live like most of the people that live around us right now. Amen and amen. I'm not going to live like my neighbors, and I'm not going to live like I used to live. I'm not going to live like the people across the street from us. I'm not going to live like the heathen down at the sheet store. Amen. I told the young men, they're jealous. I said, we're 0.75 miles from a sheet store. They were very, one young one, yes, he'd gain a lot of weight if you lived that close. Amen. They're very jealous of living 0.75 miles from a sheet store. But I promise you this, go over there in the evening sometime to the sheet store and look like somebody turned up a rock and every vermin that lives in our county pops in the sheet store after dark. Amen and amen. So don't be too jealous of having a sheet store in town. I don't live like the people that go in the sheet store. I don't stand in line buying lottery tickets and buying cigarette and buying jewels and inhalers and vapes and, and beer and wine. I don't live like that crowd. And I used to live like that crowd. I don't live like that crowd anymore and I'm still not going to live like that crowd again. That's what he's saying to them. You came out of Egypt land. I put you in Canaan land. And you're not going to live like either one of them. You're not going to live by their ordinances. You're going to live by my ordinances. Amen. Hallelujah. You shall do my judgments and keep mine ordinances to walk therein. I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments. Which if a man do, he shall live in them. There it is. That's the promise of life and the law of God. I am the Lord. None of you shall approach to any that is near kin to him to uncover their nakedness. I am the Lord. What's nakedness? Appearing naked. Uncovered. Indecent. None shall approach to any near kin of him to uncover their nakedness. Then he goes on this list. I'm not going to read this list, but you ought to read it. It talks about your sisters. It talks about your brothers, your mother. If you had a stepmother, a stepfather, uncles, aunts. I am the Lord. You know why? Because down in Egypt land, this is what they do. In Canaan land, this is what they do. Can I tell you something? We live in, 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 the, in, the, in the borough, or the a township of Green Township, Pennsylvania, named after Nathaniel Green. We live in the village of Culbertson, after the Culbertson farm. Do you realize this goes on every day in Culbertson, Pennsylvania? Every day? People uncover their nakedness near of kin. Vileness, perversion abounds. I am the Lord. So he gives us this law has never done away with this law, has never negated this law. He's fulfilled it in Jesus Christ. What does that mean? A man that does these things can find forgiveness through Christ and in Christ. He can have forgiveness of sins, but the child of God ought never, ought never be found in such condition. Why? Because it's for the lawless. It's for the unholy. It's for the profane. It's for the abusers of mankind. Amen. Amen, Brother Tim. Well, let's just give that amen word of God. Amen. God says we're not going to uncover this nakedness because I'm holy and you're holy. In verse 21, thou shalt not any of thy seed pass through the fire to Moloch. Neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God I am the Lord. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. Let me just pause right there and, and make a, a couple little comments if I could. I realize that that's, 
what it's speaking of in each of those places. But let's stop right there in the middle. Thou shalt not profane the name of the Lord thy God. What is profane? What's the opposite of holy? The law is for the profane, the unholy. What does that mean? Well, I'll be as clean as I can about this. It's to take a relationship between a husband and a wife, which is holy, and to make it profane. Fornication. Adultery. It's to take the name of the Lord thy God, which is a holy name, and make it profanity. What does that mean? Common, unclean. What does that mean? You hit your hammer, or hit, a, hit your thumb with a hammer, you take his name in vain. You profane his name. You take that which is holy and you make it a common thing. The name of the Lord thy God is holy. The name of Jesus Christ is holy. Well, I'll go ahead and weigh in on this just a little bit. I preached this pretty stout, oh, probably a dozen years ago or so. And I talked about I wouldn't let a man come in my living room and cuss me. I wouldn't let uh, a nude person walk into my living room. I wouldn't let somebody with a shirt off come in my home. It's just not going to happen. But what about the television? What about the movies? What about the internet? Lord's name in vain, profaning the things of God, cursing God, mocking God. That's why the law is given to the unrighteous man. We're numb to it today. My wife and I had a, a thing today. My wife kind of mentioned to me, she said, you know, he's a nice guy, but boy, he sure cusses a lot. I said, oh, honey, he's definitely toned it down because you're here. Amen. I said, he's toned it down because he's a female here. Why? Well, it's just his natural Natural voice. It's just natural speaking. It's just natural to him. It's just for a rabbit to run in front of a car. It's the same destruction, but it's just natural to him. And I know all about that. You can rest assured, I know all about that. I know all about that vulgarity and that cussing and that profanity. God hates it. And he said, I am the Lord, your God. It's just as vile to take the Lord's name in vain as to put your child, your seed, in the fire to mull it. If God hates it, listen, that one point of the law you offend, you're guilty of all. You may as well just go ahead and throw your children to fire and offer them up to Moloch. You may as well sacrifice your own children. You take the Lord's name in vain. That's what the Word of God is saying. You can dispute that all you want with me. That's what the Word of God is saying. Didn't mean to plug that in. Didn't mean to stand there too long, but, you know, maybe, maybe somebody helped it. Amen. I believe that God saves a man and cleans up his lips. I believe God changes how he talks. I believe God changes how he walks. I believe God changes where he goes. The steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord, and he delighteth in his way, and God has never ordered my steps back into the bar. Amen. God has never ordered my steps. Hmm. I know we're kind of close to Pennsylvania or New York here. We're almost up there in Seneca area. Boy, I never got my steps led back to the casino. Amen. Amen. Boy, there's a lot of places my steps didn't go back to. Thank God for that. Hallelujah. Bless his holy name. Quit going down to the movie house, watching all that filth. Amen. Quit going down to the swimming pool. <laughs> Quit going down to the swimming pool. All them naked people walking around. Amen. Amen. I'm a man. I'm affected by the... Boy, I, I wasn't going to make any comments. And then we, here we got stuck in a couple comments about that. Amen and amen. My wife and I take our children down to the shore. Which I said to the shore. What's the difference? We're saved. Saved people go to the shore. Everybody else goes to the beach. Amen. <laughs> you know what happens? We go down early in the morning usually. and Somebody comes and ruins our day. They sure do. And boy, I just want to go throw sand on them. I'll be honest with you. But you know what? It's a public shore, amen. And because a public shore, there's nothing we can do. What do we do? We pack up our stuff and we move. Or we go home. Saw enough of that in my lifetime to last me 50 lifetimes. I don't need that affliction on my eyes. Well, glory, God, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Verse 30, thou for thou shalt keep mine ordinance. 
that you commit not any one of these abominable customs which were committed before you and that you defile not yourselves therein. I am the Lord your God. Chapter 19, we'll be here for a little bit. Let the word of God speak. I might make a few comments, but listen, listen, I get all kinds of stuff wrong, but I didn't get that one wrong. Amen. Amen. My eyes don't need to feast on Phil. I got enough problems with my flesh. Be on faith with my wife looking, let my eyes linger. What an awful thing. What a vile thing. My poor wife, God forbid. Verse 3 of chapter 19, you shall fear every man his mother and his father and keep, his, keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. Fear every man his father and his mother. I am told us that. He also told us to honor them. In another place, he tells us not to set light by them. Boy, you see that today, boy, they listen to all these TV shows with children. Boy, they mock their parents and scoff at their parents. Their parents are dumbos and idiots. And, you know, I can't even imagine what Disney and shows like that have. I don't watch that. I haven't watched that in whatever. But I can't even imagine this, the, the disrespect and the disregard. And yet the Word of God tells you to fear them. You're to love them. You're to honor them. You're not to set light by them. That's God's word. God gave me a message probably seven, eight years ago on setting light by your father and mother. He said, let him die the death. He said, if any man curse his father and mother, be stoned with stones. I said, if any man curse his father and mother, he's be stoned with stones. You got a son that's a rebel in the Old Testament? He's a whoremonger and a drunkard. He won't listen to you, won't take heed to you. What do you do? You take him before the town that he's in and stone him with stones that he die. Oh, we're in a day of grace. A bunch of us in here can say, thank God for that. Amen. I said, a bunch of us can say, thank God for that. My wife and I know a situation, a man has cursed his dead mother on national television. Somebody said, well, you know, I mean, I think he's a good Christian man. I'm just, I'm going, well, <laughs> I said he cursed his dead mother on national television. Called her a vile, vulgar name. Amen and amen. Well, let me just move on. Verse 4, turn you not into idols, nor make to yourselves molten gods. I am the Lord your God. In verse 10, thou shalt not glean thy vineyard, neither shalt thou gather every grape of thy vineyard. Thou shalt leave them for the poor and stranger. I am the Lord your God. Somebody would say, well, we don't have a vineyard today. Well, plant one then. Amen. <laughs> No, what is he saying? Listen, can I, can I just apply this to us? Leave something for the poor and the needy. It's not yours anyway. Consider the poor. Think about the poor. They wouldn't glean everything. Why? Because the poor would come behind them. They had nothing. The, Jesus said the poor you have with you always. Leave something for them. You know why he put that in the law? To show people they're sinners. No use for the poor, despise the poor, hate the poor, think anything they got came from them. I did it. It was my hands. I labored. No. It's the goodness. If you have anything, it's the goodness of God. You had breath today. It's the goodness. If you have a skill or an ability, it was the great God of heaven that gave you that skill and gave you that. There is nothing in yourself. You could have been paraplegic, laid up in a hospital bed today, but the goodness and the mercy of God. Leave something for the poor. In verse 11, you shall not steal, neither deal falsely, neither lie one to another. You shall not swear by my name falsely, neither shall thou profane the name of thy God. I am the Lord. Thou shalt not defraud thy neighbor, neither rob him. 
The wages of him that is hired shall not abide with thee all night until the morning. Boy, I like that. Amen. <laughs> you pay him every day. That's what he said. You know why? Because there are men, and some of you probably had experienced that in your life. There are men that if they don't pay you today, you may not get it tomorrow. Amen. Might be too much of a temptation for some. Boy, you'd be amazed how you'd be amazed how many church folk are just bad, bad, bad in business. And they cheat and lie and steal and hide and cover up, rob people, unjust weights, unjust balances. You say, oh, not in the house of God. I don't do business with church people. You're crazy. Amen. We live in midnight community. Amen. You don't dare do business with me. Oh, old Proctor tells a story. He went and got a bushel of peaches, paid about twice what it's worth. The guy told him, he said, oh, man, these are the best. These are the best. Oh, man. He, he said he got them home. As soon as he peeled off the top layer, the rest of them were rotten underneath. He took them back over. He said, he said, hey, what's going on with this? The guy goes, oh, they'll can just fine. Amen. He knew they were rotten. Is that your business practice? Amen. Doing okay. It's like, I drove the whole way to Buffalo, New York. Now, to you, that's not a big deal. To me, that's a big deal. I drove the whole way to Buffalo, New York to look at a bus some 12, 13, no, I guess about 16, 17 years ago now. The guy said, man, it's mid condition. Nothing wrong with it. Well, you know what nothing wrong with it means in Buffalo, New York? A coat of paint. In front of the guy. I'm looking at this. I went. And kicked the side panel. And I mean, rust just fell out of it. He goes, that's just surface rust. <laughs> anyway, he might have been a Baptist deacon. I don't know. Amen. Don't just blame the Catholics for that. I've seen some pretty crooked people. Thou shalt not defraud thy neighbor, verse 13, the robbing the wages of him that is hired shall not abide with the old night until the morning. Thou shalt not curse the deaf, nor put a stumbling block before the blind, but shalt fear thy God, I am the Lord. Ye shall do no unrighteousness in judgment. Thou shalt not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty, but in righteousness thou shalt thou judge thy neighbor. Thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer among thy people. Well, I wouldn't, shouldn't have read that one. We might be here a while. He said, neither shalt thou stand against the blood of thy neighbor. I am the Lord. Any tail bearers? Oh, that's right. Who said that the other day? It's not gossip. It's a prayer request. Somebody in here said that the other day. Amen. We're not gossiping. We're just having prayer requests. They're little tail bearers. You know why the Lord put that in there? So that every tail bearer would see their unrighteousness. That's why he put it in there. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people. Oh, we're never going to get through this. Tell you what, let's take a break about 8.15. We'll go get some pizza. We'll find, start back up at 9, probably go to midnight or so. And that's just this verse. I said, that's just this verse. That's not to hold any grudge or bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. Does anybody remember anybody else in the scripture saying that? I'm pretty sure it was I am. When he said the second, of the second commandment is to love thy neighbor as thyself. You ever held a grudge against yourself? I haven't. I mean, you know, I've never, I'd have been so mad at me that I didn't talk to me or didn't, you know, communicate with me or kind of wouldn't look at me or wouldn't speak to me or wouldn't shake my hand or wouldn't sit near me or wouldn't talk to my children or wouldn't talk to my wife. I've never been that mad at me. But I've got to be honest with you. I'm in ministry. I've dealt with it often. I've been physically struck 
I've been shoved, pushed, cursed. Had a man gave me a forearm shiver in the back one day. Why? He told me. His brother's baptism is just as good as mine, and his brother went to heaven just like I'm going to heaven. All I said was, baptism won't save you. He physically struck me over it. Why did God put that in there? That the grudge holder might see their ways? That that bitterness might be exposed? That God could uproot that seed of bitterness before it takes hold? That the lawless might see it? We preach on bitterness for a little while. It's the poison that you drink trying to hurt somebody else. Bitterness. I preach on bitterness off the cuff. I'm now did some of you be shocked? 25 minutes. 25 minute message. Yes, I was preaching. Just preached it off the cuff last August. Two ladies, like bullets, hit the altar. One lady gets up, I mean weeping, sobbing, blowing her nose. Goes back, hugs her husband. She's back to squalling, making unintelligible noises, hugging her husband's neck. I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. So I didn't pull up that night. I said, well, we know she was bitter with her husband. How about the rest of you? The rest of them just looked down at their Bibles. I said, how about you men? He said, to love your wife and be not bitter against her. I've said many times, I'm not afraid to say it. Do you know why he told us to be not bitter against her? Because it's real easy to do. I'm going to be transparent. My wife does stuff that would drive a normal man insane. But thankfully, I'm no more normal man. Amen. (laughs) You men may as well help me out and just say amen. She'll drive you nuts. You'll drive her nuts. And that's in a good marriage. Amen. I got an amen on that, finally. That's in the best of marriages. But you know what the Lord told that man? Hey, why don't you man up? My wife doesn't hold grudges against me. You know why? Because I'm a man. Thou will not hold a grudge against me, woman. Very effective. He told me to be not bitter against her. You know why? Because, oh, man. It's so easy. It's so easy. It destroys marriages. Destroys homes. Do you realize that grudge holding the church destroys churches? Holding a grudge against your brother whom you can see. How can you love Christ who you can't see? The law of God, it's perfect. It'll convert the soul. Verse 23. When you shall come into the land and have planted all manner of trees for food, then you shall count the fruit thereof as uncircumcised. Three years shall it be as uncircumcised unto you. It shall not be eaten of. But in the fourth year, all the fruit thereof shall be holy, to praise the Lord withal. And the fifth year shall ye eat of the fruit thereof, that it may yield unto you the increase thereof. I am the Lord your God. You say, well, why is that in there? Did you notice that? He said to make it holy. That fruit can be holy. Why? They're in Canaan land. Canaan's cursed. So does that apply to the United States? No, it does not. But it applied to Israel because they're going into a cursed land. They couldn't eat that fruit. And finally, after five years, can you imagine the joy after planting that fruit tree and five years later you get to glean that fruit of it because it's holy and you can eat it and it's sanctified unto God. And your children can go out and pluck the fruit off of that tree. It's sanctified unto God. It's now holy unto God. 
That's separation unto God. Getting you out of Canaan land. Keeping you from the Canaanites. And God's now sanctified your food. God will bless your food. You shall not eat anything with the blood, neither shall you use enchantment, nor observe, observe times. You shall not round the corners of your heads, neither shalt thou mar the corners of thy beard. You shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. And people say, well, pastor, that's Old Testament. Well, so is the next verse. Do not prostitute thy daughter to cause her to be a whore. Lest the land fall to whoredom and the land become full of wickedness. Do we pick and choose? No. We obey God. Is it legal? No, it's that God can show the lawless their lawlessness. The unholy their unholiness. God is trying to reveal himself to men. And the law was the schoolmaster that brings us to Christ. Brother Don Green was a dear, dear friend. And Brother Green, back in the 60s, got a reputation. He preached against wire rim glasses. And that's all people talk about. Oh, that's the guy that preached against wire rim glasses. He told Brother Zach Vernon and I, sitting at his dining room table. He said, he said, I know people got mad at me. He said, for preaching against wire rim glasses. He said, but he said, back in the 60s, he said, they'd come in my church. He goes, they'd have their little wimpy beards and their little wire rim glasses and their long hair and they disrupt our services. They tried to look like John Lennon. He said, I started preaching against the hippies in 1965. And he said, I just decided to just keep on preaching against them to the day I died. So I still preach against wire rim glasses. Well, he had metal glasses on, but they weren't wire rimmed. People go, oh, that's so offensive. Oh, why would he preach that? To show the lawless their lawlessness. To show the unholy their unholiness. Why would God say these things? To make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead? Because they still do. The heathen still do. Do not print any marks upon you. Why? They still do. People say, well, preacher, I've already done that. It's too late. What do I do? Nothing. Nothing. Sanctify your body. Become a holy vessel. That which was unholy, make it holy. I love what John Asquith says. And I don't want to quote him a whole lot, but I love what he says. And he just says, you don't, you don't have to be a virgin to be pure. God can restore purity. God can make you pure. God can take the vilest and make them pure and make them clean. God can take the most defiled sinner and set them in the congregation of the righteous and make them pure if they'll heed the call of the law of God. I am the Lord thy God. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Verse 30, you shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. Regard not them that have familiar spirits, seek not out, neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them. Why is that in there? Because 90% of the little girls I used to come across in Hagerstown, Maryland were seeking after witchcraft. They were seeking after wizards and witches, pentagrams, crow's foot. I go up to them on the street and say, why are you wearing that necklace? And they just tell me, I'm a witch. I say, well, I'm a preacher. And I've literally had them scream at me, growl at me. I had a guy one day behind a car. Lived down the dung heap of life. He was a worm. Lived down the dung heap. And I said, sir, I'd like to give you a Bible track. And he circled around behind his car, real wary of me. And he said, this is what he said. He said, I know the Lord. And listen, I was a young convert. I wasn't real wise in some of those things. And I, I looked, I said, well, if you know the Lord, how come you have pentagram earrings? And he said, well, these I wear to show that I know the Lord. And all of a sudden, something clicks in my mind. Me and him talking about two different people here. Before the Lord, I lie not in Christ. That man started telling me my past. He said, I perceive that you've done this and you've done. I'm talking about some details you've done. I perceive that you did this. And listen, I don't know what else to say. I'm, I'm clear across the car from him. I said, sir, why don't you tell me my future? And he went. And I went, 
I was a visitation in Shippensburg with Brother Mike Cooper. And a lady came out and she said, where are you? Or who are you? I said, we're from the church. She starts casting a spell on us. I said, what are you doing? She goes, I'm a witch. And she's like, abracadabra. I mean, she's literally casting a spell on us. You say, oh, that's all phony baloney. Walk through Shingle House and find out. Go out on Halloween. Amen. Go out on Halloween sometime. Find out. You know why it's in there? In the hopes of some little girls playing with Ouija boards and pentagrams, playing with the dark side, reading those vampire books, reading the witchcraft, sucking up Harry Potter in hopes that she'll see her lawlessness and her rebellion against God and the unholiness. Amen and amen. Well, I don't know about you all. I feel like we're a little bit deeper in the trench now. I feel like we could just settle in. I'm deep enough in the trench. We could probably settle in for some pretty good warfare tonight. Amen. I hope you're not in a hurry. Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head and honor the face of the old man and fear thy God. I am the Lord. Thank God for the aged saints of God. You know what he says? Rise up before them. You stand in honor of them. He comes by the gate. You don't sit down. You stand in honor of him. That's, that's what the law said. You know why? Because we're in a day when they hate old people. That's no offense to all you old people, but they hate you. Our government prefer you dead. The liberals would prefer you dead. You're a drain on society. Your social security money. Your health care. They despise the aged today. My grandma turned 100 back in January. Now listen, people say this all the time about, you know, well, she doesn't look a day. My grandma looks 100. <laughs> she doesn't look 99, 90, she looks 100 years old. She's my grandma. She's not a leech on society. She's my grandma. And I want to honor her and love her and cherish her. But it's not just her. I want to respect those aged saints. Now listen, I want to respect them if they lose their minds. I want to respect them when they go to the nursing home. I want to respect them all the day. I want to honor that hoary head. You know why? Because the Lord said to. I am said to. Amen. If a stranger sojourn with thee in your land, you shall not vex him, but the stranger that dwelleth with you shall be unto you as one born among you, and thou shalt love him as thyself, for ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Thank the Lord for Mexicans. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Who else is going to win him to God? Who else is going to win him to God? Who else is going to reach him? I'll be honest. We have a yard sale in our house. The Haitians come. They drive me nuts. You know, that's my wife. I'll go, oh, here they come. I mean, it's like a whore. Man, they swarm into the yard. They trash our yard sale. One guy was waving knives one time. I mean, some nice Henkel German knives. He's waiting around. He's like, one dollar, one dollar, one dollar. I said, no, ten dollars. He's like, why? I said, put him down. He's like, one dollar. I went. He went, ah. <laughs> Not being funny. That's a true story. They drive me nuts. We still give them a track. Try to be kind. They don't want to be kind to us normally, but we try to be kind. But I'll tell you what, the Hispanics come. Boy, they're friendly. They never stole a thing from us. They'll try to talk to you. We try to keep Spanish tracks, give them Spanish tracks. Who's going to win them to God? What if you had to go live in Mexico? How would you want to be treated? You were once in Egypt. Listen, you can put any category of people you want in there. Some of your ancestors came from Poland. They wrote a whole book of jokes about your people. Amen. I don't know where my people crawled off the boat. I know where they ended up. They ended up in the Midwest. 
were Craig's, McVeigh's, Spratt's, Vison. You realize somebody treated them right? Somebody gave them opportunity? Somebody gave them a job? Somebody let them have their thick brogue and their bad accent and the fact they didn't speak English? We're doing okay. If a stranger, I know this is Israel, but if a stranger comes, it could be how you treat people. Can I be personal? Does that hit a nerve at all, Stephen? Doesn't hit a nerve, does it? Stephen married a second generation Mexican named Samantha. She's gone this week. That's why Stephen's been up here sad, lonely, dejected. Second, she's second generation, right? Third generation. Second generation. My wife and I, we went to a Mexican restaurant, La Jolla, downtown Chambersburg. The girl's running it. They have to run it because their mom doesn't speak English, I don't think. And she's in the back just making soups and sauces and sauces. And we got, I mean, just some of the friendliest girls. And they remind me of Samantha all the time because we met her. She was just nice, friendly, happy girl. You know, imagine, imagine. Somebody treat her parents like dogs. You don't belong here. You don't belong here. Now imagine you treat someone like that in church. You don't belong here. I just preached at a church and my wife did not go with me because she was with child greatly and greatly afflicted. I told her to stay home. I traveled local in Pennsylvania, went to a church, and I talked about this just briefly. And I talked about that little girl, and it's always a stereotype I've created in my preaching of the little girl at the convenience store with the blue hair and the bone in her nose. And her eyelids tattooed shut and piercings through her ears and her nose and her belly. And I talk about loving that little girl because that little girl's a soul that Jesus Christ died for. And I walked into the Rudder store that, that evening late. And you know what? She was standing there at the register. And I paid for my drink and I went back out. And I got a track out of the car and I went back in. I got one except you repent. At Victory Press in Tennessee, and I took it in. I said, ma'am, I said, I'm a preacher of the gospel, and I said, I want to give you this tract. The Lord impressed upon me to give this tract. You know what she did? She was, sir, I want to thank you for that. Thank you very much for that. And she took that tract, began to read that tract, stand there at the register. And the thought across my mind, even when I was in the store, how many churches would she be welcome in? How many churches would accept her? There's a family that was here last night, Monday night. I've said to their face more than one time, when they first showed up at Black Creek Baptist Church, I was there the first night they ever walked in the house of God. And I remember saying in my heart, I said, that family will never stick. That family will, I mean, children out of control, house out of control, lives out of control. I said, that, the little girl with Down syndrome, that's her parents she was with back there, Ray, Ray. She was pretty young at the time. I remember just thinking, man, that family will never stick. It was three days after you got saved, they walked in the house of God. Three days after they all got saved. I showed back up in March. I'm like, oh, that family's here. Now, they probably won't stick around long. <laughs> Did you notice I said they were here last night? <laughs> Did we pick up on that? <laughs> Woo, Hallelujah. Jody was in her back room one day, called a pastor, called, I think called Ruth Ann first. Said, God just saved me. Oh, what a difference when Jesus passed by. The lawless, the stranger, and yet we're called to not vex them, but to love them as our own, to love our neighbors as ourselves. Now, church, you listen to the preacher. I haven't scratched the surface. I have hardly scratched what the Word of God says of the I am of law. He deals with the priest. He gives laws for the stranger. He deals with conduct. He deals with Israel. He deals with their manner of living. Why? In the hopes that they would see him, I am, in that law. When you walk through that tabernacle, what do you see? At the first thing you see, I am. You say, what is that? I am the door. You walk in, what's the next thing you see? Directly there. 
You see that candlestick? I am the light of the world. You go to that table. What's on that table? I am the bread of life. You go on through that tabernacle. You walk on through that tabernacle and you see Christ. That's part of the law. You go on down through the ordinances and you continue to see Jesus Christ and the law of God, the I am. But you know what stands out more than anything else? I am holy. Be ye holy as I am holy. Why did he give you this law? Because he himself never violated it. He never cursed, though they cursed him. He never spoke evil, though they beat him. They mocked him. They scoffed at him. How did he treat strangers? I don't know. Ask the Samaritan. Ask the woman at the well. Ask the woman with the issue of blood. Ask the unclean leper. That woman with the issue of blood violated the law of God, which she reached out and touched the hem of his garment, and he did perceive that virtue had gone out from him. What did he do? Made her whole. A leper came to him, violated the law of God. Ungodly. What did Jesus do? He healed him. What did God do for some of us that were lawbreakers? Made us whole. When I first went in the house of God after I got saved, it was down at the altar, down about here. The pastor came over, he said, son, what'd you come for? I said, well, you gave an invitation. I, I don't remember exactly, but I said, you named such and such, and I felt like I need to come pray about that. He goes, well, do you need to be saved? And I remember looking up, and for the first time possibly in my life, I said, no, sir, I am saved. And literally, he stood up, shocked, said out loud, did you know that Tim McVeigh saved? His son later told me, he said, the first time you came to church, he said, we were all scared. He said, there are men watching you. I didn't know. I was too dumb, naive. But you know what's amazing? I walked in the house of God. They're watching me like a hawk. They're scared because I came to the house of God. They knew me. Some of the people did. They'd seen my life. They told me of a teen event. I don't remember anybody being there. They told me of a teen event at the bowling alley. They had to leave because of me and my friends. And normally when we went to the bowl now together, we had to leave. They usually kick us out, but they had to leave because of us. And he told me, he said, last time I saw you was at the bowling alley, and we had to leave because of you and your buddies. And I said, but I'm sorry, man, I didn't know. I said, I was just lost. I was lost. But even as I sat there with people watching me and people wondering, what in the world is he doing here? Why is he here? What's going on? They began to sing those songs. My heart began to fill. And I knew I belonged. It didn't matter how anybody else treated me. I knew I was in the right place. Because Jesus Christ had taken a lawless man and made him a new creature. He'd taken an unholy man and made him holy. He'd taken an unclean vessel and purified him. The I am of law. I'm going to stop there tonight. I got, oh my, 30, 25, 30 more verses. But let me read Deuteronomy 29. Moses' last song, if you will. Deuteronomy 29, verse 1. These are the words of the covenant which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the children of Israel in the land of Moab beside the covenant which he made with them at Horeb. 
And Moses called unto all Israel and said unto them, Ye have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt unto Pharaoh, and unto all his servants, and all his land. The great temptations which thine eyes have seen, the signs and those great miracles. Yet the Lord hath not given you in heart to perceive, and eyes to see, and ears to hear unto this day. And I have led you forty years in the wilderness. Your clothes are not waxen old upon you, and thy shoe is not waxen old upon thy foot. Ye have not eaten bread, neither have you drunk wine or strong drink, that ye might know that I am the Lord your God. He fed them with manna in the wilderness. He gave them the law in the wilderness. He sanctified them unto himself in the wilderness that they might know I 